Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and today we're gonna finish the 32 core Threadripper Unraid server build by installing and setting up Unraid. Now, if you're interested in this desktop server, home servers in general, you can check out my last video where I built this system and outlined many of the principles to consider when building or planning a home server. There's a link in the description below, but today the agenda is to download Unraid, set up the Unraid boot USB drive, outline some of the UEFI settings, launch the Unraid server, learn how to access the server remotely, and before we set anything up, we'll test the system memory and drives to ensure there are no actual or potential problems before we put data on the system. Once the tests are complete, we'll set up the network attached storage pool and network shares, add users to the server, map the network shares to both my PC and Mac, I'll demonstrate how to install containerized apps and if there's time a virtual desktop. And finally, I'll go over the many use cases I have planned for this server to answer the question, why bother? That's the plan, let's execute. It's the money. Okay, let's get rolling with the server setup and in the list of possible operating systems I could go with for my server, I'm going with Unraid. To answer the question why, first it comes down to my storage drives. I have a mix of eight and four terabyte hard drives and one terabyte NVMe SSDs. I also want the flexibility to expand the NAS as needed. Those are a couple of the strong points of Unraid. And secondly, I've just never ran Unraid, so it's a new playground to explore. I'll use the trial key. If I don't like it, I'll switch to TrueNAS scale maybe. Okay, let's get Unraid. So open a web browser and navigate to unraid.net. Click download and download the USB creator tool for Mac or for Windows. Now, if you're not aware, Unraid installs two and boots from a USB thumb drive. The two requirements are it needs to be between two and 32 gigabytes and it must contain a globally unique identifier. I'm using a 16 gigabyte SanDisk Cruiser Fit which I'll plug into my laptop now and launch the Unraid Flash Creator tool. In step one, I'll select the latest stable version of Unraid, which today is 6.10.2, and I'll click Customize, allowing me to name my server. I'm gonna keep the network mode to DHCP and allow my router to sign an IP address, and I'm going to click Allow UEFI Boot because my, like most modern consumer motherboards, runs a UEFI BIOS. If you have an older motherboard or you have CSM compatibility mode enabled, you don't need to click this so you can allow for legacy BIOS booting. In part two, I'll select my SanDisk USD and then click right. That process will take a couple of minutes and once done, I can eject the USB and plug it into my Unraid server. For this next part, you'll need a monitor and a keyboard connected to do the UEFI BIO settings and memory testing and initial Unraid boot. First thing is to power on the server and enter the UEFI menu. For me, I'll just hit delete when prompted to do that and I'm in. Now, of course, every BIOS is different, but the thing you will need to find and ensure is enabled are first, virtualization. In my Asus AMD motherboard, it's under advanced CPU configuration and it's called SVM mode. Some Intel motherboards call it VTX and IOMMU may be a separate setting. That will need to be enabled too. As you get to know your server, you may set other optional settings like I've set the ECC scrub rate, enabled energy saving features, and customized the CPU fan curve. But what you need to do is ensure the Unraid flash drive is the default boot device. Once that's done, save and reset, and on reboot, you should be met with this menu. Now, before we even start the server, select the bottom memtest86 and run the test. This will run a comprehensive stability test on your server RAM, and it takes several hours. It took over nine hours on my systems, but once the test is complete, hopefully your RAM passed. If not, you'll need to adjust the settings. Start by disabling XMP or DOCP if it's enabled. You'll definitely don't want unstable memory in a server, especially as Unraid runs completely in RAM. If it passed, go ahead and reboot your server and you should be greeted with this menu again, and this time, select the first option to start Unraid. A lot of text will scroll by, and if yours ends with this being the server name you selected, of course, write down the IPv4 IP address, which for me is 10.0.0.183. And that's it. 
the server is now running and I can access it from any other system on my network. So on my laptop, I'll open a web browser and in the address bar, type in the IP address for my server. You should land here where you can set a root password for your server. Next, you'll either need to purchase an Unraid license. The current pricing runs from $59 for six drives 89 for 12 or 129 for unlimited drives, or like I'm doing, you can go with the trial. Next, this is optional, but I went ahead and signed up for the MyServer beta, mostly just to check it out. But with that out of the way, we're in the main page of the server interface, and here we can create our array, but before we do that, I wanna test all the disks to make sure there are no problems before I build the array and move my data to it. So if I scroll to the bottom of the page, I can see all the disks attached to the server. Click on the device name, click the self-test tab, and then next to smart extended self-test, click start. This will run the standard smart self-test, but also check the surface of the entire disk. So it'll take time, but again, better to figure out if there's a problem now. And as a matter of fact, shortly after starting the test on all my spinning disks, I discovered a problem in that my eight terabyte WD red drives were getting pretty hot. I installed them in the basement drive tray where they're sandwiched together and don't get much airflow. That was an oversight on my part. So I stopped the test and rearranged my drives. After moving the larger and hotter drives to the top of the case and restarting the test, they didn't pass 40 degrees. And after about 12 hours, the test was done and completed without error for all of my drives. Now that we know our RAM and drives are stable, we can build the array. On the main page, I'll first select my parity drive. This should be the largest disk available, so I'll select one of my eight terabyte disks. The parity drive will hold information needed to rebuild data in the event of a disk failure and will not be included in the total amount of storage space on your array. A single parity drive will protect from a single drive failure and two parity drives will protect from two simultaneous drive failures. As I only have six mechanical drives in my array, I'll just go with a single parity disk. If I had eight or more drives, I'd probably go with double parity. Now I can select the disks for the array and disk one will be the one terabyte Samsung NVMe drive, then my other eight terabyte drive. Disks three through six are my Seagate four terabyte drives. Next, under pool devices, I'll click add pool to create my cache pool. The cache pool is where data transferred to the NAS is initially set and later moved to the array. This is done for speed as cache drives are typically faster SSDs. I have two devices to use as cache drives, which are the Intel NVMe drives. Once I have all my array and pool devices selected, I can start the array. And as soon as I do, the server starts building the parity. However, you notice that all the disks are unmountable because they need to be formatted, which I'll do now. And like the warning says here, this will erase any data that is on those disks. The formatting took about eight minutes and now my array devices are XFS formatted and the cache pool is ButterFS. But you notice that the two one terabyte cache NVM drives are pooled in what is essentially a RAID 1 config so I only have one terabyte of available cache space. Now this is the recommended way to do this. That way if one of your cache drive fails before the data is moved to the array, you won't lose any data but I want all two terabytes, so I'm gonna rebalance the cache pool in a RAID 0 config. Now I have the space, but no redundancy, so if just one drive fails, I lose all the data on both drives. I'm okay with this as I'll never delete my original data source until the data is moved to the array, but you'll wanna definitely weigh your options accordingly. Okay, the Unraid storage array is all set up, but the parity is still being built, so I'm gonna wait until that's finished before I do anything else. Which, flash forward, took over 15 hours, but now I have a 24.8 terabyte storage array with a two terabyte cache. But in order to use the NAS, I need to create shares or file systems I'll be able to access from other devices on my network. So in the shares tab, click add share, name the share, and the only other settings I'll change are select yes, I want to use the cache pool for this share, and I will exclude disk one, the Samsung NVMe from this share, so none of the data added to this share will be stored on that SSD. I'll be creating a second share that uses just this SSD, but I'll explain that later. But now our first share is added, 
but I don't always want to access my mapped shares as the root user. So click on the users tab and let's add a user. I'll add me and give me a password and add. And now I have a new user who can access shares, but not affect the server overall. But now I need to set up access to share. So back to the share tab and click on the share I just created. And at the bottom in the security settings, first, I want to ensure the share is visible to the network. So change export to yes. And then I'll change the security from public to secure. When I click apply, a user access menu appears. And here I can assign the type of access to all the users on the server. For now, that's just me. So I'll give myself read and write access to the share. If you select private as the security type, you'll also have the option to give users no access to the share at all. All right, now that the server is set up, we have a share and a user to access them. So now we need to add that share to other computers on the network. So let's do that for both Windows and Mac. First for Windows, open your file explorer, click on this PC and either click the three dots in the menu or right click on my PC and select map network drive. Here you can select a drive letter and the share folder, which will be backslash backslash server IP or name, backslash, and the share name. Select connect using different credentials and finish, and then enter the credentials and okay. And there is your empty network attached drive. Now I can make directories or add files. I'll make a couple of folders. And if I go back to the server, we can see those folders are reflected in the share. For Mac, open finder and the first option I have is to click network, click on the server and then click connect as enter my user credentials. And now I have access to all the shares on the server that user CJ has permission to access. Or I can map individual shares by opening finder, hitting command K on the keyboard to bring up the connect to server dialog, enter share name and click connect. Now, if you haven't already logged into the server like I did, then you'll need to enter your user credentials and then have the option to save them to your keychain. And now you have the share under your network locations. To ensure you reconnect to the server with every reboot, open system preferences, and in users and groups, click login items tab, and then drag that folder into the login items. And that's it. You have a really flexible NAS up and running, but that's only part of what an Unraid server is capable of. Now, I'm going to demonstrate a couple more functions the server is capable of. These won't be step-by-step -step guides to follow along with, but will give you a better idea of the endless possibilities of having your own server. So the first thing I'll demonstrate is how to install and use a containerized or Docker app. And it's so simple in Unraid. First, click the apps tab and click install to install the community applications plugin. Once installed, you have a multitude of applications to choose from. I'm going to use my server to automate the process of transcoding my footage and sorting it to the NAS. So I'll search for an app called Handbrake. And now I can just click install and configure the app. This is where the folders I created earlier come in. I'll select the input folder as my watch folder and the output folder as my output. Once it's installed, I can launch the Handbrake web UI and configure and save a custom preset that will apply to all media handbrake and codes once I go back to the app setting and input that preset. Now Handbrake will watch that input folder and once I transfer media files to it, Handbrake will begin transcoding them into the output folder. You can see all the CPU cores spinning up here and Handbrake is working on the job. Now I've just completely automated the process I've had to do manually. I can just dump all the B-roll footage from my camera drives to the NAS and let it do the work. There are also apps I can use to take the files from the output folder and sort them into their permanent folders on the NAS. So that was one way to drastically save drive space without drastically sacrificing quality, but not all the footage I produce is compatible with Handbrake. So how can I do the same thing with my Blackmagic RAW footage? Well, I use Adobe Media Encoder for that. Unfortunately, there's no Docker app for Media Encoder. However, I can install a virtual operating system on the server. So let's install a Windows 10 virtual machine on the server. First, I'll need to download the Windows 10 installation ISO and place it in the ISO's share. 
I'll also need to download the latest virtual drivers for window, which is easy to do in the VM manager and settings. Now in the VM tab, click add, select Windows 10 and assign it some CPU cores, memory and disk space, locate the installation ISO and drivers and click create. This will launch a new window where you'll go through essentially the same steps as installing windows on a bare metal PC. You'll just need to locate, install some drivers along the way. Once it's installed, you'll have a functional Windows operating system running virtually on your server. There are a few steps to take to get it running smoothly, like installing more drivers, but from here I can map drives just like I did on my laptop and download and install Media Encoder. I'm not going to take you through all that. At this point, it's no different from installing it and setting it up with watch folders and encoding presets than it is on a bare metal PC, but now it'll just sit on the server and do the work I needed to do in the background and I can access it from any computer on my network, even my Macs. So that's just two ways I can use this server, but of course, for those who wonder why bother, or why do you need such a high spec server? Well, those are fair questions. Most people don't need a server like this, but I'll be doing so much more. First, I'll be installing Plex and moving my media library to the server, and I'll offload the Plex transcoding to the GPU. I'll be installing LAN cache to centralize my Steam, Epic, Blizzards, all my game libraries. This will allow just the server to get updates to my game libraries and then all the other gaming PCs in the house can pull the updates from the server, saving on the 1.2 terabyte internet band limits I have. Thanks, Infinity. I'll run sync things, which I can set up on all the family's computers and even phones, and that will automatically back up their data to the NAS and then I can run our clone that will push that data from the server to my cloud backup service. I'll be setting up a direct 10 gigabit connection from the server to my Mac studio. And like I mentioned, of the many shares I'll set up, one will just use the fast NVMe SSD. That'll hold all my stock media that I regularly access so I can edit directly from the server without having to move those media files. And like I said in the beginning, it's a playground. I can quickly and easily spin up virtual machines to explore and test different operating systems. It's definitely robust and powerful enough to spin up a gaming VM, well, actually multiple gaming VMs. Not that I really plan to, but I am interested in maybe trying to spin up a Steam OS VM. But first, I need to get my data off all the portable drives it's currently sitting on. That's gonna take time, but what would you use a home server for and what might you like to see more detailed info on? I was thinking maybe of doing a five minute tutorial series on some of those things I just mentioned. I'm not sure YouTube doesn't like when you break from your mold. Let me know in the comments and of course, spread the love with a like and maybe consider subscribing for a wide assortment of tech related content. I hope to see you in the next one.